the day. It is the Shadow Secretary of State for International Trade, the Right Honourable Emily Thornbury, and I'm going to hand over to Emily now. Thank you very much, Daisy. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I, uh, I'd like to also to thank the Society of uh, Motor Manufacturers and Traders for inviting me to join you at today's groundbreaking event. Um, it seems astonishing to me that uh, that this is the SMMT's first dedicated event on automat automotive trade. Before I joined you, I was looking back at the times that the society was mentioned in the House of Commons. The Society of Motor Manufacturers was first mentioned in 1910. The full title of the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders was first used in 1928. And the abbreviation, the SMMT, was first used in 1944. Now, the reason that I mention this is not just to give the nerds amongst you a bit of red meat, but because all of those occasions have one thing in common. The MPs referencing the society weren't talking about taxation or the state of the roads or speed limits or any of the other hotly contested debates to which the SMMT have contributed over the years. No, in all three cases, they were asking questions of the Secretary of State for trade. And in every case, they were asking about the government strategy for the export of British made cars. So the issues that we're discussing today have always been at the heart of our politics ever since the birth of the motor car. And it's vital that politicians on all sides continue to listen, engage and act on what the SMMT and its members have to say. Indeed, looking back at the debate I mentioned in 1944, I was struck by the contribution of the MP Irene Ward, who responded to the assurances of the Trade Secretary that his department was, and I quote, in constant contact with the SMMT. Miss Ward politely replied to him, can the right honourable gentleman say what benefit the SMMT gets out of the constant contact with his department? And 77 years on, I'm sure Miss Ward would want us to make the same invocation to today's Trade Secretary, not just to read today's report and discuss it with the industry, but to go away and put its recommendations into practice. At this hugely challenging time for the industry, it is especially necessary, and I will continue that historic tradition of pressing them on the subject when Parliament returns next week. And there are three issues which I think are paramount. The first, of course, is the transition to electric vehicles. And I was listening to the to the conversation, the debate earlier on with some interest. It was 100 years ago this week that the SMMT's annual lunch at Olympia, although I think they may have called it luncheon, I suppose, in those days. Anyway, over the rubber chicken, they heard the chair of the London County Council, the equivalent of Sadiq Khan today, and he vowed to eliminate the last remaining horse-drawn vehicles from the council service and switch entirely to motor-powered fire engines and ambulances instead. Now, a, a century on, we are engaged in another seismic transition. And again, the role of the government is crucial in that. And what we need is an active industrial strategy which will make Britain a world leader in the production and export of electric vehicles and we must have a trade policy which supports that strategy. And there is a decision to, to be made in terms of that policy. Do we go down the route envisaged in the trade deal with the EU where domestic battery production takes place alongside domestic manufacturing with the time and investment required to make that happen? Or do we go down the route envisaged in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, where the strength in battery production stays where it is in Japan and elsewhere, but we have liberalized rules of origin to facilitate trade in batteries and minimize tariffs on our completed vehicles. And I simply say this, whichever of those routes we choose is not as important it is important which route we choose, but whichever route it is that we in the end do choose, it's not as important as taking a clear decision one way or the other and making sure whichever strategy we adopt is therefore a success. What we can't afford to do is to equivocate and prevaricate and find ourselves in a few years time either left behind in the global market because of a lack of investment or cut out of the global market because of trade barriers. 
Now, the second issue that I want to mention is dialogue between government and industry. 65 years ago, last month, the Trade Secretary, Peter Thornycroft, was welcomed to Earl's Court for the Motor Show by the president of the SMMT. And when he posed for pictures with the captains of industry, the photographers shouted out, look as if you're talking, please. Like his predecessor in the House of Commons in 1944, Thornycroft assured the photographer that he was also constantly talking to the industry. And we have heard the same refrain from ministers of all governments down the decades. But that dialogue does not, needs to mean something. And crucially, it, I believe that it has to take place before decisions are made in order to inform government thinking, not after the decisions are made, in some effort to explain their thinking. I think that the recent decision to scrap the current trade show access programme was a case in point. I have to say, I haven't met a single business across any industry who understands why that decision was made, let alone any who agree with it. And don't get me started on what people say about being consulted about it. I hope that whatever new programme is put in its place, it will be one that is developed in genuine dialogue with you and other industry groups, you know, actual back and forth, and will re replicate everything positive about the programme that it is replacing but with increased funding to go with it, because trade is so important. And the same goes for the trade the department's trade advisory groups. Now, we've been promised a reset of how these groups operate so that the SMMT and others have a genuine chance to influence the objectives and proposed outcomes for our country's new trade arrangements with India, Mexico and others, uh, including bringing your expertise to the negotiating table on vital issues like rules of origin. So I will press the new Trade Secretary to make sure that she delivers on that. And the final issue that I want to highlight today is arguably the most important and certainly the most topical, and that is the status of our trade with Europe. 50 years ago next week at the SMMT's annual dinner, Ted Heath was loudly applauded by the delegates present when he said that the common market was one from which Britain's major industries could not afford to be excluded. The SMMT's president pledged support for his policy and however the European debate has shifted since then, one constant truth has remained, that we must not allow Britain's car industry to lose its free access to the European market. None of us here were in any doubt how dangerous a no deal Brexit would have been for our car industry and none of us should be in any doubt now how dangerous it is to hear media pundits, anti-European MPs and even government ministers now flirting with talk of a trade war with the EU. That is total and utter lunacy in my book. And the fact that it is so entirely avoidable makes it all the worse. And when I hear people say, well, at least the motor industry should be OK because Germany has as much to lose as we do. I recall those same conversations this time last year and I think, what on, why on earth would we take that risk? Why on earth are we putting ourselves through all of this all over again? Especially when we already have so much on our plates with the crisis over supply chains, labour shortages, energy bills, prolonged and compounding the huge economic damage caused by the pandemic over the last 18 months. The British economy is facing a steep and rocky road in these coming months. We really shouldn't be hobbling ourselves unnecessarily. So surely the last thing that we need to do is to shoot ourselves in the foot over trade with Europe. My final thought, my final thought is this. It's as true today as it was last year and indeed 50 years ago when Ted Heath was speaking to the SMMT. We cannot risk the imposition of tariffs on our car exports to the EU. We cannot risk any change to the transition period on rules of origin. We cannot risk a trade war, full stop. So I hope if today's Secretary of State uh, for Trade is listening to the SMMT, as all her predecessors have done for the last hundred years, if she is reading the new report that you have produced and paying attention to the views of delegates on this call, I hope that she will speak to her more reckless colleagues and urge them to dial down the rhetoric with Brussels to get round the table instead and do what is best for British industry. 
That is all any of us should be focused on right now. And I can assure you that I will do my part to keep ministers focused on that outcome when we get back to Parliament next week. Thank you very much for having me today. Well, Emily Thornbury, thank you so very much for joining us um, and joining us live. And I know I think we've got just about a minute. I can squeeze in a quick question. We've had a few questions from you, but I'm just going to choose um, <clears throat> the top one um, and uh, throw it over to you. And I think I know what the answer is, um, Emily Thornbury, to this question, but I will ask it to you anyway. Do you believe that the Trade Secretary and government are consulting enough with industry, civil society, and so on throughout the negotiations of free trade agreements. Are they consulting enough, Emily Thornbury? Well, yes, Daisy, the, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I, the way I would put it is this, you know, we had our trade essentially done for us on behalf of us by the European Union for nearly 50 years. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that anybody in Whitehall should be so arrogant as to believe that they have all the answers. We have a great deal to learn from industry, from, you know, from society generally. And also, we need to start getting a debate going so that the public understand how important a good trade policy is and all the things that could be achieved by a trade policy which lines up with our economic policy, but also expresses our values. Almost like, it's almost like the kind of, the muscle behind your foreign policy, but mm. it's also really important to be, to be underpinning your economic policy by a good trade policy. And I think we have a long way to go and we have to learn from those who know.